It's my uh, great honor to be able to uh, uh, introduce a, a senior career foreign service officer um, who served with distinction for her country, the United States of America, um, in Eurasia, um, particularly in former Soviet Union, uh, Central Asia, and also in, in China. Um, she is now the senior fellow at the Paul Tsai China Center at Yale Law School, and her last assignment in the US State Department was as, as Assistant Secretary for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Um, in our discussion um, just before lunch, I actually learned that uh, Ms. Thornton is a person of multiple talents, and with her husband, besides her work at Yale, is also managing a large farm in New England, which includes working horses. I was particularly, as a Western Canadian, I was particularly impressed by that, and I also discovered that uh, we served in respective embassies in Beijing for at least one year in the earliest part of the century. Um, please uh, join me in welcoming Ms. Thornton, and we are very fortunate to be able to have her here today. Thank you, Ms. Thornton. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go up here. Thank you very much, Gordon, and um, thank you all for being here today at this auspicious event. Um, thank you to uh, Hong Nong for inviting me here and to Professor Wu Shitsun for having uh, all of us gathered here uh, for this very important event. Uh, I am really glad that the last panel that we heard before lunch was uh, upbeat and optimistic. I find that there's a short supply of optimism on U.S.-China relations, especially in this town. Uh, I think I should probably start by saying that you know, outside of Washington, the mood is not quite as dark. And so I encourage all of you, if you start to get a little bit uh, frustrated or uh, depressed, to go out outside of the Beltway because uh, things are looking a lot better out there. Um, and I gather that Ambassador Tsui Tian Kai uh, is taking up that advice and traveling a lot in, in the United States. Uh, I always found when I lived in China, if things got too frustrating in Beijing, if you take a trip out to the provinces and talk to local people, things look much better somehow. So maybe we should uh, listen more to the wisdom of our respective peoples out there. Um, First, I want to talk about, you know, this is the 40th anniversary year of the normalization of U.S.-China relations. And there's a narrative going around in this town, at least, not maybe not too many other places, we can hope, um, that, that US, the, the, the engagement policy that was per pursued for 40 years is somehow um, you know, was a mistake or a failure. And I just want to put the issue to rest here right away at the top of the uh, discussion this afternoon. Um, you know, U.S.-China engagement over the last 40 years has been tremendously productive and successful. And we have seen 40 years of unprecedented peace in the East Asia region brought about in large part by this opening to China that Nixon and Henry Kissinger envisioned and that the wise and visionary leadership of President Carter cemented in 1979. Uh, we've also seen incredible prosperity uh, emerge in the East Asia region, not just in China, the whole Asia miracle um, in economic growth, prosperity, global well-being and, um, you know, and, and human well-being. And I think um, it is not at all real reasonable to say that the engagement policy with, uh, between the U.S. and China, I mean, th that was essential to bring this about. So we can't forget that when we're talking about, you know, what, what was engagement, what wasn't it, whether it was successful or a failure. There may be people that were so optimistic and so hopeful about engagement that they got, um, you know, a little bit fantasizing about what, you know, might it bring about, and especially with respect to changes in the internal environment in China, and that's and it's discussion that we can have, but it, you can't say because your wildest dreams didn't come true that the enterprise was, was not um, successful. Uh, 
Second, I want to just make clear that uh, you know we've heard this morning in the first panel, especially about um, the kind of juncture that we find ourselves in right now in U.S.-China relations, um, being a fairly serious and fairly even um, verging on a crisis in U.S.-China relations. Unprecedented, I think somebody said, since the opening up in 1979. Um, I, I would like to say that people should be pretty clear-eyed about what's at stake if you're going to take this um, crisis and, and move it into a full-blown kind of confrontational atmosphere between the United States and China. And I think some of the speakers today have hit on this. I think this is something that is not well appreciated in the United States. Maybe it's better appreciated on the Chinese side, but I have found a lack of understanding, lack of uh, or remoteness. I think Doug Paul used this phrase, remoteness from facts. I love that. Um, you know, leadership is so important in U.S.-China relations, and we need wise and visionary leadership now like never before. And if we're not going to get it from our capitals, we have to get it from out there among concerned citizens, scholars, experts, people like in, here in the audience, people like those I saw uh, yesterday at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, those I saw the day before that at the University of Michigan at a conference. There are a lot of people out there who care a lot about U.S.-China relations and I believe have a very clear understanding of the stakes in this uh, tremendously important, vital, and as we said um, in a previous administration, consequential relationship for not just our two peoples, but for the entire world. Um, next, I want to talk a little bit about what's going wrong. <laughs> and I was at a meeting not too long ago with a bunch of Chinese counterparts, and people were talking about rivalry and um, and you know, are the U.S. and China going to become adversaries? And one of the Chinese participants said, you know, well, we don't see the United States as an adversary. We see the United States as a threat, <laughs> uh, which kind of was something that brought everybody in the meeting up short. Interesting that 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 was surprising to people. And then one of the U.S. participants said back well, we don't see China as an adversary. We see you as a threat, too. <laughs> um, and the Chinese side, interestingly, was kind of like, oh, come on. China doesn't threaten the United States. But, but this is now um, the kind of discussion, the kind of discourse, the kind of mutual threat perceptions that are emerging. I personally think that this is a huge change, especially on the part of the United States. We've traditionally seen China as a major opportunity. Going back even more than 100 years, we saw China as a major opportunity. You know, United States um, merchants, traders, missionaries, all wanted to go and, you know, bring China to the world, open up China, um, you know, take advantage of opportunities that China presented. And uh, that has continued, I think, through right up until maybe now, um, that we've always seen China more as an opportunity than as a threat. And uh, I think most of the U.S. participants in that meeting were also, um, like I said, kind of surprised that, you know, this Chinese participant said, we see you as a threat, because the U.S. side does not think of, we don't think of ourselves as threatening China. In fact, and you've heard this actually in, among a lot of discussions in the current administration, many people um, have a narrative that, you know, the U.S. Has, has done almost too much to help China. And someone mentioned that this morning as well, that um, not only have we not threatened China, we have done... Uh, a huge amount to make China this Im incredible success that it that it is today, and to have it emerge as it has onto the global stage. Uh, so, how can China think that the U.S. threatens it? I think we need a lot more discussion, frankly, of why it is that we each feel threatened by the other. But let me just lay out a couple of the things on the U.S. side. When I talk to U.S. audiences, I always try to talk to them about you know, what it is that China thinks, wants, 
uh, why China feels threatened. When I talk to audiences like this, I think it's important for me to try to get at what it is that the U.S. is thinking. So um, nobody has really answered this question in a direct way, but I will take a stab at lining up a few things that probably uh, would get at the question of why does the U.S. now see China as a threat. Um, the first one, which unfortunately China can't do anything about, is size. Uh, you know, China has five times the population of the U.S. It's pretty soon going to have the largest economy in the world. Um, if, by, I mean, by some measures, some people say it already has the largest economy in the world. But, um, you know, that's just scary. And I think one of the geniuses of Tao Guang Yang Hui was that Chinese leaders realized that China's size was going to um, feel worrisome, concerning to others, uh, and so adopted this kind of lower profile approach, especially in foreign policy, because they understood that size was an issue. Uh, second, I think, thing that the U.S. feels threatened about with respect to China is the state direction and involvement in the economy, and this is very serious, um, because you know, we understood when China acceded to the WTO and Bill Clinton, bless his heart, worked so hard to get the WTO accession agreement. Charlene Barshevsky, a, a fellow uh, colleague at the Yale Law School, you know, negotiated. Of course, China did a lot too, but we understood China was going to move to a market economy. And those were the commitments we understood that were made, that, that, that opening and reform was an unstoppable path forward for China's system uh, moving into and joining China into the international, global, financial, trading, and economic system. Not to mention all the other in international institutions, but certainly the trading um, sphere. And, and now what we see, I mean, there's some very worrisome indicators, and I'm very happy that, I think it was uh, Suba, was it? mentioned that he believes that the reform and opening is in a period of renewal in China and is waiting at the end of this trade negotiation to erupt onto the world stage and assure everyone that China's reform and opening is continuing in a more robust way than ever before. I'm, I'm hoping that that's true, but uh, so far no one is um, uh, saying that they are seeing that. So. I hope that that will come, and I think that that is what is needed right now. Yesterday I was asked, if I was the president of China, what would I do to fix U.S.-China relations? I said, get a trade agreement that shows that China is not closing down, that reform and opening is continue bigger, better, and greater than ever before, and that's what I hope will happen. But, um, you know, a couple of things that, in specific terms, make people feel threatened. Okay, one, um, and these are two stories, but there are a lot of other stories, semiconductors. You can't have a conversation with people in Washington without the topic of semiconductors coming up. Why is that? Well, there is a case out there um, that's been publicized, it's in the public domain, about China's determination to get DRAM chip technology of um, the whole story of how they went about doing it through through stealing away some employees, getting the technology, copying it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then there's the semiconductor program of the Chinese central government. And people say that the U.S. has the foundational high-end technologies, but the only way our companies can continue to produce those high-end foundational technologies is if they can make money on the lower-end chips that they sell in big volumes. And if China goes ahead and produces these low-end chips in big volumes to avoid licensing uh, fees from the U.S. producers, the U.S. producers who produce the high-end things will not be able to compete 
and will go out of business. And that, and, and because of the dumping that we've seen in things like steel and tires and other products over the years, we've seen what you know the solar panels case did to U.S. solar industry. We've seen a wind turbine case, you know, also put U.S. companies out of business. By the time these cases get resolved, and someone mentioned the three-year-long WTO litigation process needing reform, I agree with that. We can't solve it through these mechanisms that currently exist. Um, the other case, and frankly, maybe this is even more concerning, is the case of Norway and the Nobel Prize Committee and the treatment of um, the treatment of companies, private economic commerce, uh, in retaliation for something that a government does, or in this case, it wasn't even the government; it was an organization resident in that country. So this kind of using the state's power to punish private companies who are not even involved in decisions that are made. They're supposed to be operating in a market economy that's based on profits, that's based on competitive efficiencies, et cetera. Introducing politics into all those transactions is, is fundamentally altering the, the agreement that we all made when we joined the WTO. So people are very worried about this tendency that we've seen on the part of the Chinese government to, to use those tools. Um, so that's uh, the second sort of threat. The third, I think, is the, is the one um, that we're familiar with and that has been mentioned, which is about the sort of what, how is China going to view its commitments um, and agreements that it signed up to in the international system, and how are we going to make our legal systems fit together, the international legal system and our individual national legal systems, and how will people be held accountable for their commitments, and et cetera, et cetera. And those are questions that have been ongoing in the entire U.S.-China relationship, but they're getting more... Um, serious, I think, now. And China also wants to presumably change some of these rules or adjust some things in the international system, but we're not really sure exactly what that looks like. Um, so I think people are nervous about that. And I think also just the how are our legal systems going to go forward and, and fit into the global picture without having these constant um, perceptions of unfairness, cheating, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about so far today are the risks and identifying the risks. I think the biggest risk right now is that we're becoming prisoners of our own narratives about the other side. I think that's a very big problem. And these narratives, as has already been mentioned, are slightly remote from facts in a lot of cases. They're a lot of times in the service of domestic political um, ends narrow domestic political and sometimes very short-term domestic political ends. And that's, that's a big problem. That's not just a big problem for the U.S.-China relationship. That's a big problem for U.S. foreign policy and U.S. diplomacy, I think. And I hope that that can be remedied going forward. Um, I think uh, the other risk is that we'll do major damage to our own interests if we keep this conflict and this kind of confrontational um, relationship going and don't get down to figuring out how to get back to practical, constructive cooperation. Um, I worry that we're going to do tremendous damage to both of our economies. And the, and the, the kind of trend line that I see going in technology is, is at the heart of that worry that I have. Uh, I see both countries, despite what um, we heard uh, in the second panel about technology and the fundamental common interests we have, I see both countries already moving to put in place actual practices and regulations and regimes to, to, to really separate the technological regime. So I'm quite worried about that. Um, I'm worried that we're both undermining the international system that has served certainly China, certainly the US, probably more than anyone else so well. Um, the inter international system is fundamentally keeping order in the, in the uh, global trading and legal and uh, political environment. And if we don't uh, keep that and strengthen it, it will be to our own detriment. Um, and then I think uh, 
the focus on competition, and I liked um, certainly what uh, Shan Ding Li uh, was talking about with uh, coopetition. I've heard people say that, but I personally believe that the focus on competition will become ingrained and will lead to a permanent zero-sum thinking about the relationship, which can only, in my view, lead to conflict. If we don't focus on um, the common ground, the positive space for cooperation, the interests that overlap, and how we're going to work together, I am, I am worried. I'm not afraid of competition, but there's more, there's more to a strategy and there's more to a relationship than competition, and you have to have balance. Um, I think Larry Summers' question that was mentioned by, I think it was Yahweh this morning, about what is it that China wants and what is it that the United States wants out of this relationship, or what do we each want from the other is very important, has not been adequately answered or thought about even. Um, I think uh, certainly at, at high levels, maybe even in, in both governments. Um, so if we look at what do we want, I think there's a lot of confusion on both sides about what the other wants. And, uh, you know, I have my own assessment of what China wants based on long time working with Chinese counterparts. Um, and, you know, I have some idea of why there might be a difference between, you know, what China thinks it wants and or wants you know, from us and what, and the difference between that and its actions on the ground. Um, because there's this narrative in the U.S. that, uh, you know, when China tells us it can't do something, it's just, it's just, you know, there's no political constraints in the Chinese system. It's an authoritarian, top-down system, and when China tells us it can't do something, that's just because it doesn't want to do it. Um, it could do it, but it's not doing it, and they shouldn't try to tell us that they can't get things done because the local environment, you know, local government officials won't implement something, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's um, a common misconception in the U.S. Um, but there are many different narratives out there in the U.S. about about what China wants from the U.S. and um, why it does or doesn't do certain things, and. Last night in, uh, in uh, North Carolina, I was asked about Mike Pillsbury's book. Um, and, you know, there are many compelling things in that book. And a lot of people um, know about the sort of pieces of evidence that he has marshaled to show that China has this kind of negative plan to take over the world and... Um, you know, displace the United States. And so that narrative is out there. And uh, the only way we're going to, you know, overcome that narrative and, and have a better consensus-driven common narrative is to show by actions that this is not the case. I think uh, one of the problem, <coughs> excuse me, one of the problems is that, um, you know, we, we say a lot of words, but it's really the actions that people look at. And so I think one of the things that we could do to improve the situation is to try to get some more candor into the discussions that we have. And I think, you know, the U.S. is kind of an open book and China's kind of a closed book, and that imbalance um, does not serve us well in a lot of cases. Um, so let me um, just ask a couple of questions about what it is that China wants. And this will give you some sense of why the US is confused about what China wants. Does China support foreign businesses doing well in the China market? Most Chinese I know would say, of course we do, and they would have a lot of examples. But there's a suspicion on the part of a lot of people that that's not really going to be the long-term uh, view of the Chinese government about foreign business in China. Uh, can China separate its obsession with security concerns from its view of foreign participants, either in society in China or in the, in the commercial space? Uh, what kind of reform and opening does China see, and will it continue? So I think this is fundamental. I mean, and I've said publicly many times that you know, I was quite worried about what I viewed as a closing of China's uh, space for 
political, economic, social discourse, um, the commitment to opening and reform. So I hope, like I said, that we're seeing that change. Um, and you know, to what lengths will China go to, to support the international system? What does it want to change about the international system? These are all questions. People think China wants to change the international system or overthrow the international system, um, but we don't really know what China wants there. Um, so I think um, it's also wouldn't be surprising if China was confused about what the US wants, and I'm pretty confused about what the US wants actually right now too. But um, let me posit for you a few things that I think no matter who is in the White House, um, these are things that the U.S. wants. Uh, the U.S. wants to maintain its leadership of the international system. The U.S. wants to continue to develop and grow its economic power in an open market-based trading system that's fair. Uh, the U.S. wants to keep the peace in East Asia and wants or needs to maintain an active presence there to keep a sustainable balance in the face of uncertainty over China's future trajectory on security issues in that region. The US uh, wants China to abide by the letter and spirit of international agreements, rules, and norms that it signs up to, and including those embodying respect for rule of law and uh, international indi uh, individual rights. And the U.S. wants China to engage in spreading good governance. So I think, you know, that's a long list of wants and some of them are very general, but, you know, it's a starting point for a conversation. I think all of those uh, things on both sides that we want are actually within the realm of discussion and agreement between the two sides. Um, or at least we can have a conversation and get improved understanding on all those issues. There's a lot of questions, I think, on the U.S. side, and maybe China has a lot of questions about what the U.S. wants, too, and that's reasonable, and we should talk about that. Um, I, I certainly agree with the Liu Yahweh that the U.S. is making a mistake in being n so not confident in the face of China's you know, success and China's rise. Um, I think, you know, there's too much overhyping of, of, you know, ch fear of China. And um, it's, uh, it's not recognizing the incredible strengths that the U.S. brings to the table um, in economic and other kinds of, of power. And um, it's, it's, it's kind of not staying faithful and true to our own principles and our own uh, values about what we've set up here and what we believe in and what people in China obviously still feel is very attractive about the United States, you know, with lots of Chinese travelers here, people coming to study and conduct research and open up businesses, et cetera. So um, I feel that this lack of confidence is unwarranted. A big problem that's already been identified um, in the panels earlier this morning is the U.S. you know calling or, or, or trying to describe China as an irresponsible uh, kind of actor uh, across the board but you know in particular we've heard discussions about technology and about uh, development and uh, d development finance. I don't think that this description of China as irresponsible accords with people's experiences in general um, in these cases, and it damages U.S. credibility and and our prospects for cooperation for the U.S. to just paint uh, uh, with a w with a broad brush these kinds of efforts. Um, there's specific facts, there's specific cases, and there's a lot of cases where people are quite, um, as has been mentioned, happy to get this kind of attention and investment. And um, there's also cases where it's not going so well. And I think. One of the things uh, that we've seen is that China's government does learn from mistakes. It makes mistakes, which all governments do, and then it learns from those mistakes. And I think the U.S. would be much better served by participating in the learning process with China and by participating in the positive efforts that China's trying to undertake. 
Um, I have been, when I've been traveling around the U.S., describing a need for a, a co-evolution of, of U.S. and China policies in many of these areas. And I think I, co-evolution is a good way to think about it because things are changing very fast in our modern era with, with technological change and everything else. And we are going to both need to change and adapt and be resilient. And we ought to try to figure out ways that doing that together and also with other partners can help us um, adapt to changing times. And a lot of this is, is in the technology space and, and Kai Fu Lee has written about some of this. But I think we're gonna be facing a lot of dislocations and challenges um, another thing that I talk about when I go around and talk to audiences about U.S.-China relations is the sort of unrealistic view that most of the problems that we face today uh, can are, are in a context of U.S. bilateral problems, U.S.-China bilateral problems. Most of the problems that we face, and we heard about some of them today, are going to come from transnational kinds of challenges, as we've seen for the last two decades, actually. Um, you know, things like terrorism, things like environmental degradation, product and food safety, aging populations, disease, health, um, you know, other kinds of macroeconomic and other um, uh, dislocations. So these are the kinds of things that, you know, the U.S. and China will inevitably end up um, being called to work on together. And I think it would be helpful if we would sort of start thinking more in those terms and less in this kind of bilateral framework that leaves out so many other partners and players in the world that are important as well. Um, so I will just talk through maybe a couple of the areas where I think this co-evolution would be most useful. Um, First, um, I think one of the ones I always bring up, and people are always surprised, municipal governance. You know, China has 160 cities of over a million people, and it is making improvements in being responsive to average citizens' needs living in large cities, things like utilities, things like bus routes, things like other other just daily needs of people that are living in a compact space like that. And I think there's a lot that we could learn. I'm currently at Yale Law School, and we um, are following the issue that China is resolving a lot of court cases online. Now, this is not good news for all those U.S. lawyers that are out there. But, you know, this could really, if we talk about, you know, how long litigation takes and how frustrating that is for everybody, I mean, this... If, if this can be done in a way that's helpful and, and satisfactory and resolves disputes fairly and is seen by people as responsive to meeting their problems, this could be something that, you know, we could work on together. Uh, I think these kinds of areas are very promising. Um, East Asian security, I talked about that. That's going to be a very hard one for us to uh, co-evolve on, but we have to do it. We have to figure out how we're going to manage coexistence in the East Asia um, security sphere. And I mentioned, you know, that I think that um, there's a major role for the continued U.S. security presence to play there that would also be actually to China's advantage and to the general advantage of the region. Uh, but, you know, China may not agree with that, and we'll need to talk about that. But um, we have to do that. Technology was already mentioned. I won't talk a lot about that. But I tend to agree with um, our speaker, our panelist, about the uh, incredible opportunities for cooperation in technology and, and almost this sort of need to cooperate on technology. So I'm quite worried about where that one's going. International system reform, WTO was mentioned, but there are a lot of other international institutions that need, need help, need reform, need change, and the U.S. and China should be working together on those, and I think we can. Um, I talked about sort of some of the transnational issues. I mean, China's got a rapidly aging population. The U.S. has a lot to bring to the table on these issues that we've dealt with, and I think that would be another good area for cooperation. So I will talk long enough. I will leave it there. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Please. Sure. 
Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Thornton. And um, I'm going to use the prerogative of being the uh, moderator to ask the first question. I'm not looking for long answers here, but it's a simple question, perhaps not easy to answer. In the short, medium, and long term, are you an optimist or a pessimist about the bilateral relationship? <laughs> well, I'm definitely an optimist by nature. Um, I think in the short term, if there is um, movement toward the kind of trade agreement that I talked about that would send a clear signal of continued determination on the part of China to, to open and reform, that would um, make me optimistic. The medium term could be a bit more difficult, but a lot would depend on, on what's happening in the two countries' political systems and how much of a signal is being sent about, about you know, making improvements in various areas. And in the long term, I'm definitely an optimist because I just don't see any way that we can uh, let this, you know, deteriorate. Thank you very much. Now, we're going to squeeze in a couple quick questions. So if you could please just identify yourself to be given the mic and pose a short question. We can get a few more in that way. Uh, please proceed. And uh, I see one right here and then over there. Per perhaps this gentleman right here first. And again, you, as Doug Paul said, you have to wave your hand a bit so we can spot you in these bright lights. Please identify yourself and Thanks, I'm with People's Daily, that's a newspaper in China. So we see there's much talk about the possible meeting between the two presidents for the recent weeks. So my question is, to what extent can we expect this meeting to help stabilize the relationship? Thanks. Uh, yeah, so I don't have any uh, particular specific information about uh, when a meeting might happen, but certainly I think the discussion within U.S.-China relationship recently has been too narrowly focused on the uh, economic and trade issues. And, you know, one thing that's happened is that there's almost no uh, communication. All of the mechanisms that we've set up to discuss specific issues with the Chinese government and make progress have almost all atrophied or, or been canceled or, or taken down. So I think, you know, what we would hope to see is if we can get the trade agreement finished, then we can broaden out the relationship and get it back on a, on a track where we would be discussing the full range of issues. It's a really complicated, complex relationship. We have so many issues to discuss, and it's, it's a bit strange that we're only talking about you know, this narrow trade issue right now. Thank you. And to this gentleman over here, and then to President Wu. Over here, please, and then President Wu, please. Hi, Susan. This is Frank from China Daily. Uh, you know that uh, this, is, this year marks the sixth year since China launched the Belt and Road Initiative. And right now, the United States uh, still remains on the sidelines. So do you think is this something that should be changed? Uh, what do you think should be the U.S. role in this initiative? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I mean, I've been on record in public as being fairly skeptical about uh, the Belt and Road as an initiative, as a campaign. Um, you know, I think that these things are commercial projects and that commercial projects should be weighed on uh, sort of commercial terms. And the politicization that's sort of behind the Belt and Road is probably not resulting in efficient capital allocation for the Chinese economy. So that part of the Belt and Road, you know, I have some questions about. But in general, as if it's a development aid program, then certainly there's a lot of um, scope for more help from the developing and developed world for other countries to develop infrastructure included. And I think you know the U.S. has an opportunity to get involved with this. And as long as, like I said, commercial uh, projects are, you know. Um, sustainable and and meet high standards. I, I think that um, you know the U.S. has an opportunity to participate in those and should be a little bit more balanced in looking at these opportunities. President Susan. Okay, uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, appreciate your wonderful remarks. Uh, it's uh, you know impressive me. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I suppose to have two questions, because the one question you have already addressed, uh, uh, if you're uh, optimistic or pessimistic about the uh, future China-US relations. The second question I have, 
because uh, your uh, former senior diplomat worked with the State Department uh, in charge of East Asia and uh, China affairs. So my question is, uh, from your perspective, to what extent the current U.S. State Department has its voice uh, towards U.S.-China policy? In other words, uh, do you think the current U.S. State Department still has its decisive saying over China, uh, U.S. policy, you know, uh, towards China? In the current administration, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we all um, are aware that the policy-making process in the current administration is a bit unorthodox and uh, does frequently change because the personalities change. So, um, you know, now, I mean, I, I served uh, for a short period of time with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, but, you know, John Bolton was not really in that job for very much time when I was in government, but what my, you know, observation is, is that the policy making process that we would all be familiar with, um, where multiple agencies come together and make recommendations and people discuss and consider, that's not really uh, the way things are going. So that's why I mentioned in response to the earlier question that things have been too narrowly focused on the trade agenda. Um, a lot of other issues are not really uh, getting play in the, you know, policy process or in the discussion process or in the strategy making process. And I think that's very unfortunate. Um, you know, the State Department, there, there's a lot of literature out there among IR theorists about the role of the State Department in the last, you know, seven decades and how it's waxed and waned. I mean, leadership is the most important thing. and. Um, you know, when the State Department has good leadership, um, it, it, it has a lot of say. It depends on how close the person is who's in the State Department to the White House and the President often. And in this, in this case, you know, Mike Pompeo is quite close to President Trump, but he doesn't really seem to be playing a major role on, on China. And I think in the current administration, it's really President Trump that's focused on the China relationship. Um, which, you know, uh, he talks about his close relationship with President Xi Jinping, and I think he does have, a, you know, a feeling of a good relationship with President Xi. And so, you know, I think we can hope that they're going to have another meeting, and let's see if they can move the ball ahead. We have time for one last question. This gentleman here, please identify yourself. Thank you. Dong Huiyu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. Um, my question for Susan is about the uh, Taiwan issue in U.S.-China relations. Uh, I remember two weeks ago, you had a presentation in CSIS saying that maintaining the status quo is the only option uh, for all sides. Um, but I also read in a speech made by uh, Richard Bush in Indiana uh, University uh, talking about the danger uh, of this triangle relations, uh, talking about the Taiwan's politics, Beijing's ambitions, and U.S. policy. So my question for you is, is maintaining the status quo feasible at this moment when all these momentums are evolving. So uh, what's your view on the Taiwan issue in the U.S.-China relations? Thank you. Uh, my view on the Taiwan issue is that it's not going to be, um, you know, resolved or uh, moved significantly in the near term from where we are now. And so maintaining the status quo is the responsibility of Beijing, Taipei, and Washington. And that that can be done, um, that all three parties actually would be uh, satisfied with that. And two of the three parties have actually said that that's their policy. Um, you know, Beijing has not said that maintaining the status quo is its um, you know, policy, but it, it has 
acted in accordance with maintaining the status quo. Um, and so I think that is where we are, and I think that is uh, the, where we'll be for the foreseeable future. And I, I, like I said in my remarks, I think it's really the only option for the near to medium term on this issue. And we've done a pretty good job of maintaining the peace across the Taiwan Strait for all these years, and I think we can certainly continue to do that with you know, wise leadership and caution, as Liu Yahweh mentioned on, on this issue, which is still the most sensitive and the most, has the most potential as a flashpoint in US-China relations. I have a sense that we could carry on this dialogue with uh, Susan Thornton through the rest of the afternoon quite handily, but I'm under strict instructions to bring the uh, discussion to a close. But please, uh, before we do that, uh, join me in thanking Susan Thornton for being okay. so forthright. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thornton and Professor Holden. Uh, I have, frankly speaking, I'm not knowledgeable or brave enough trying to summarize what has been discussed today given the wealth and depth of all the topics presented by our very distinguished panelists today, uh, which cover a lot of issues from politics, security, to maritime issues, to Africa engagement, to NGO practices, and to technology advancement. And if I have to uh, select a few key words for today's discussion, I learn four words from uh, what has been discussed today. Competition, cooperation, convergence, and a new word just I learned from Professor Thornton, cooperation. And I would like to thank all our speakers for sharing with us uh, your expertise and wisdoms. Although you might not reach consensus on the current state of US-China relations, and you might not on the same page in looking to the future, what is the nature of the US-China relations. And I'm happy to hear that Professor Thornton mentioning she's holding a optimistic uh, views on the future, although it's looking at the long term. But I think we are all on the same page, or we can at least reach consensus that we all hold, hold um, deep host for enhanced US-China relations, which are going to benefit the two countries and two people and also to the world. ICAS, um, I would like to, uh, on behalf of ICAS, I would like to thank you for all of your support to our work. As a very young think tank based here in Harvard, DC, and we're going to try as hard as possible to further um, facilitate the exchange of views between scholars from both countries, exchange views of people, and also trying to serve, as we mentioned, our mission to serve as a bridge to helping the two countries from our think tank's perspective to enhance these bilateral relations. And I would like to thank our co-organizer of this event, and the National Institute for South China Sea Studies and the China Program of Carter Center and the China Institute of uh, University of Boston, Canada, and also Wuhan University for supporting today's uh, event. And I would like to also thank all of you for making this way for our, uh, for our presence here today. And I also like to thank the colleagues in ICAS for your great support. And last but not least, I want to thank all the students who volunteer to help organize and putting together all this logistics from all very well-known universities in, uh, in DC. So. The students are future for our bilateral relations, so we're very thankful for all of you. And what is the direction that we might see in the future of U.S.-China relations? That remains a like open question, and hopefully we'll have a better or clear answer in our next year's annual conference. Hope to see you again next year. Have a good day. Thank you. <laughs>